Starting off this countdown, we have the tortured trains. Now, this isn't so much a theory as it actually happens in the show. So basically, if these trains are deemed unworthy or are no longer useful, then they end up being scrapped or dismantled, aka they're killed. Throughout numerous episodes, you even see this happen. There was one episode where they literally pulled the train apart into pieces. They hooked him up to another train and that train kept going until they ripped him in half. Like how messed up is that? Or you have a train that was turned into a generator and his corpse was stuck behind a shed. There he just lives motionless for the rest of his life. The trains are terrified of this or worse things happening to them and they live in constant fear. In one episode, you have the train named Hyro. Hyro is shown living living and hiding out in the woods since he is terrified that he is too old and will be deemed useless and then murdered. Or how about the episode where the manager of the railway totally harassed the train James? He painted him pink so that people would just laugh and make fun of him. As a result, James was humiliated and spent the whole episode hiding in a tunnel. How messed up is that? Coming in at number 9, we have the psychiatric hospital child. Now, people have a theory that Thomas the Tank Engine is literally just a child playing with his train set. I mean, this would explain why there's only one voice for all of the characters, and often it's in third person. It's the child explaining the story. It also explains why the trains talk but don't move their faces, just their eyes. This is also why the human characters remain motionless. So people think that this child is locked in a psychiatric hospital and the only toys he plays with are these ones. The child has a very sadistic mind and tortures these trains. In fact, the child imagines himself as Sir Topham, the controller of the trains. He then lashes out at the trains, often destroying them. The hospital is trying to get the boy to control his dark thoughts through play, but he can't, so he always ends up killing the trains. At number 8 we have Dipper Time Looped Wendy. Wendy is of course the big crush of Dipper throughout the whole show. Even though she is much older than him and she doesn't repay the child like butterflies, she's still one of Dipper's good friends and the source of many adventures. But in one episode where Mabel and Dipper go back in time, they run into a young Wendy who says Dipper is cute. Now this image of Dipper could have been locked away inside Wendy's brain, thus making her grow closer to him in the future, not realizing that this is the same person she met in the past. This loop then locks the two into many episodes where they can go on adventures together. Without this moment happening, we literally don't get so much of the craziness that comes out of the show, and maybe they never defeat Bill. At number 7, the memory gun doesn't erase memories. The memory gun seems to work like some sort of neuralizer, like the thing from Men in Black, wiping people's memories so they forget everything they have seen in Gravity Falls. I mean, a lot of crazy stuff goes on down there, so I bet there would be people who would rather live peacefully rather than remember the time they were almost eaten by zombies. But when Stan is smacked with the memory gun, he's later able to recover some of his memories. People say he was able to do this because the memory gun only covers your old memories. It locks them away like the sunken place from Get Out, but in a lot less creepy way. So if you encounter things to do with your old memories, it can recharge them in your mind, will remember everything. This is why looking through the photo album at the end of the show recovers all of Stan's old memories. Now at number six is the prequel. This theory comes from Redditor Jacob Blah, who claims that the Croods is actually the prequel to the Flintstones. Now think about it, Guy is probably the first homo sapien to discover things like joke telling, making fun fire, keeping animals as pets, and more. He is more advanced than the crews and can progress them further, which he does end up doing in the end. When the movie ends, we see all of them building this version of civilization in paradise while using prehistoric animals as tools. And which other civilization uses dinosaurs as tools? The Flintstones. Maybe the crews and the cro manons existed harmoniously and one point in the distant future the town of Bedrock was founded, or that initial civilization eventually became Bedrock. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Coming in at number 5 is the sequel, where we just explored the before, so it's only fair that we now explore the after. According to the same Redditor, The Croods could have also been the sequel to the Ice Age movies. The Ice Age obviously took place a long time before The Croods came along, but both movies have very similar animation styles, except Ice Age is obviously more focused on animals and The Croods is more on people. Scratch and Belt are also very similar, although the link isn't fully fleshed out, I can kinda see where Jacob is going with this one. I will give you credit where it's due, although I wish you had more research or backup to back up your statement. In our fourth spot, we have the lost episode. Now, there are so many shows that people claim to have a lost episode, and Courage the Cowardly Dog is no stranger to this phenomena. 
So people have created a theory saying that there are multiple lost episodes out there that are much darker and gorier. Let me describe one of the episodes. So they claim that this episode starts with static before it eventually shows Courage wearing a mask while rocking in a chair. He then drags Eustace and Muriel to the basement and chains them to the wall. He begins to torture them while they beg and cry for him to stop. Then he ties ropes around their necks and strangles them to death. The episode ends with him back in the rocking chair just staring at the camera with a large grin on his face for two minutes straight. Creepy. Moving on to number three, we have the theory that Courage is a real dog. So dogs are said to be a man's best friend. They are typically very loyal and will protect their owners at any cost. Like you hear stories of dogs getting lost and then traveling miles to find their way back home to their owner. So what if that's kind of the case for Courage? He's just a regular dog that is trying to protect his owners from any threat. However, the threats he sees aren't real. Let me explain. So Courage was abandoned as a puppy. That right there can leave any dog traumatized and scared of the world. As a result, he sees all other humans besides his owners as monsters. This explains why Mariel and Eustace aren't bothered by the monsters. In addition, in the opening sequence for every episode, Courage sees his shadow and imagines it as some scary monster. Then at the end of the opening, Eustace yells at him and says, stupid dog, you made me look bad. After he says that, his head morphs into a green monster. So this means that whenever someone is angry, he views them as a monster. Another instance is in the episode The Quilt Club. In this episode, Courage is afraid of the Stitch Sisters, two conjoined sisters. But Muriel isn't. Well, that's because in reality, they are just twin sisters. And again, Courage regards them as monsters. So the whole show is from the dog's point of view, who is just so traumatized from his past that he imagines everything is scary and out to get him. At number two, we have Jerry is the evil one. Throughout the show, it always seems like Tom is the big bad cat and Jerry is the little cunning mouse who's able to outsmart his larger adversary. But when you sit down and actually watch the show, it's Tom usually just trying to live his life. He will be either teaching a little cat how to be a cat or trying to seduce some lovely lady cat, but then he'll do something that inconveniences Jerry and instead of Jerry just, and instead of Jerry just coming out to talk with him and deal with the problem, he drops an anvil on his head. Like dude, talk about over overreacting. You need to chill out a little bit and talk about your problems. On several occasions, it's Jerry who instigates the conflict, and if he was actually a sweet little mouse who was constantly at a disadvantage, then why would he always be trying to start problems? I think Tom might be the peaceful one and he just wants to be left alone. And for the number one spot, we have Blue Cat Blues. This is probably the most famous conspiracy theory when it comes to Tom and Jerry. There is an episode of the famous show that is titled Blue Cat Blues. It opens with Tom sitting on train tracks and a narrator saying, in a few minutes, it will all be over. And Tom looks terrible. He has huge bags under his eyes, he has stubble all over his face, and he is the saddest we have ever seen him. It then cuts to a flashback and we get to see what has turned Tom into this sad sack. We see that he just had his heart broken by this lady cat. He did everything in his power to try and woo her, but she decided to take off with another. So Jerry comes in to comfort him. And then we see a flashback about Jerry's love life, and we see how she left him for another mouse. So the two of them are now depressed, sitting on train tracks waiting for the train to come in. Obviously, we don't see them die, but many fans say this is where the show ends. That the two died that day taking their own lives on those train tracks. And number 10, we have Bill Isn't Dead. The troublemaker that is at the heart of a lot of the Gravity Falls episodes is of course Bill, the yellow glowing triangle with mysterious powers that looks like he's some sort of metaphor for the Illuminati or some sort of secret organization. Well at the end of the show Bill finally kicks the bucket when he is lured into a trap and then cracked with the memory gun. Just keep that as a side note if you ever want to get rid of a supernatural triangle that is how you do it. Now right before Bill dies he utters a code that you can't hear normally but if you play the episode in reverse you can hear him say a x o l o t l my time has come to burn i invoke the ancient power that i may return now will we ever see him come back well who knows it's up to disney on whether or not they bring the show back and with the coronavirus going on i don't think they're really expanding their catalog at this time but if the show does come back in show format or maybe in movie format, we might see the reincarnation of this character and I'm sure this secret code will play a role. At number nine, we have Bill wrote the journals. One of the best quest lines in the show is the hunt for the journals. At every twist and turn, Dipper and Mabel are trying to hunt down these journals so they can get 
Ford out of the other dimension and bring an end to Bill. But how is the information locked away in these journals? For sure, Ford knows a lot about what's going on with them, and it seems like they're packed with information to defeat Bill. But here's the thing, Bill would know how to kill himself, and Bill was always one step ahead of everyone. Maybe this was all part of Bill's master plan. Maybe they only think they killed Bill because Bill altered all their memories, and the reason they thought Ford wrote the journals originally is also because Bill altered their memories. And now Bill has set everything up so he can come back even more powerful. At number eight, we have the trains are humans. Yep, that's right. People have theorized that the trains were once real people. These people are now trapped inside the trains' bodies and can no longer control themselves. They can only move their eyes and they can't even speak on behalf of themselves. So, how did these people become trains? Well, people believe that Sir Topham is an evil scientist that had a bunch of henchmen working for him. When these humans were no longer useful, he turned them into trains. And when they're no longer useful as trains, he kills them. Another theory is that there was an explosion at a nuclear power plant. As a result, all the workers turned into these weird gray blobs with everything being paralyzed but their eyes. Now in order to preserve them, Sir Topham placed them on trains and that's why the trains have gray faces. Moving on to number 7 we have the slaves. So people believe that these trains are slaves. Every day they have to work their hardest to avoid death. They are constantly worrying that they will be deemed useless useless, because once they're considered useless, then they're sentenced to death. So they all have been instilled with this fear in order to make them work harder. These trains are literally overworked, and they always have to do as they're told. Sounds like slavery to me. They don't get a say in the matter, it's literally they work or they get killed. Coming in at number 6 we have the apocalypse. So this theory believes that this show takes place in a post apocalyptic train depot. So apparently this area is the only safe zone out there. In fact, in one of the Thomas books it reads, engines on the other railway aren't safe now. Their controllers are cruel. They don't like engines anymore. They put them on cold, damp sidings, and then they cut them up. How mortifying is that? And how is that even in a children's book? Now, this town still treats the trains pretty poorly. So it makes me wonder, if we think that this is bad, then how worse is it outside of town? And number four is The Other Planet. This series comes from a now deleted Reddit user and focuses on Grug and his apparent superhuman strength. According to the theory, the crudes aren't Neanderthals on Earth. In fact, they're probably not on Earth at all. Now, there's a reason why they can all lift incredibly heavy boulders and kick tree logs hundreds of feet away. Normal humans cannot do that. They also can't fall from tall Last heights and walk away from them unscathed. Yes, I recognize that it is a cartoon and physics isn't really a thing that has to be taken seriously, but the theory claims that the crudes actually populate an alien planet where gravity is really low, which would pretty much explain everything and the weird animals and the weird geographic layout. You know, how there's a whole paradise right behind the wall of the cave. Filling at number three slot is the future. According to this fan theory, Guy isn't from the crudacious period at all. Isn't it a little odd that he can invent things that were actually invented centuries? Trees later? How could the man be that smart or have that much forethought based on the world he currently lives in? The theory suggests Guy is actually from the future but just wears prehistoric clothing to fit in with the crudes and so they're not afraid of him, which doesn't really go to plan. He lies to them about his parents being dead so they don't ask to go visit them because in reality they're very much healthy and alive, they just don't exist yet in the crudes timeline. Guy chooses to go back and help the family because their survival ensures the rest of humanity's survival. So Guy has to make sure they survive the end so we can survive the world. Now at number 2 is Guy. This theory is incestuous because somehow there's always one that is but I just wanted to give you guys a disclaimer before I get into the nasty. Now according to this now deleted reddit user, Grug isn't just wary of Guy because he's different or even more intelligent than him. He despises Guy because Eep is his property. Cavemen had no understanding of family or a daughter being someone you can't have sexual relations with because she's your offspring. It's like cats, siblings will literally mate despite being born in the same litter and I'm just there like hello. That's your brother. Either way, according to this theory, Grug's place in Eep's life was being threatened by a man who was smarter than him and who he could see that she was slowly falling for, which, I mean, ew, is Uga not enough for you? 
And finally, at number one is colonization. This theory claims that the movie, more specifically the relationship between the Croods and Guy, is one that resembles the first impressions between white colonizers and Native Americans. Colonizers were disgusted to see how Native Americans were living, their hunter-gatherer lifestyle was deemed barbaric despite it not hurting anyone and it working quite well for them. In that sense, Guy is the Native American in this scenario. But the movie plays history on its head because instead of annihilating all the Native Americans, or in this case Guy, the two work together and peacefully coexist, something that cavemen could apparently accomplish, but not colonizers. I don't know guys, I don't know. At number 10 we have Tom and Jerry as Nazi propaganda. Some of you might think this theory is a little forced, but there's actually a lot of evidence. Now the show is obviously about a never ending battle of a cat and mouse, but what is the common outcome of these encounters? Well they usually end with Jerry outsmarting Tom, even though he's a little mouse and he has to get away from a big scary cat. But the names Tom and Jerry could be referenced to the British military troops which were referred to as Tommies, and the Germans which were referred to as Jerry. The reason that Jerry is always able to outwit Tom is because the secret message in the show is that the Germans are smarter than the Brits, and to add a little bit more fuel to the fire, the show came out in 1940, so there's a good chance that the creators knew all about this army slang. Perhaps there's, perhaps the show has been spewing Nazi propaganda this whole time. And number nine, we have the show is in hell. What would hell be like? I mean, I understand it's supposed to be some sort of great suffering where we're tortured and beyond what we could possibly imagine. Well, what would be a worse torture than being a cat who can't even catch a mouse? You do whatever you can to catch this mouse, but it always slips through your fingers and you're and it's always able to outsmart you at every turn. Now, I'm not saying that the show takes place in a cat's hell, although if any animal could go to hell, it would be cats. They are just rude all the time. But what I am saying is that this is the eternal torture for some person. Basically, someone used to be a person, then they got turned into a cat in hell. Because Tom and Jerry live in the worst version of Groundhog Day I've ever seen. Unless you're Jerry, then it's pretty bang on. There is also a big bad dog that chases Tom around, who is one of the only figures in the show that Tom is afraid of. This could be the representation of Cerberus, who is a three-headed dog and the guardian of the underworld in Greek mythology. Or maybe cats, mice, and dogs have just been at each other's throats for so long that this is the most logical step in creating new characters. At number eight, we have their feud brought the end of the world. These two are always at each other's throats and want to kill one another no matter what the cost. Well, some people think that they eventually got their way. This is why they stopped making new episodes. I mean, the real answer is that the show was just finished its run and they didn't have to make any new content anymore. This kind of plays into the theory that the show had something to do with the Nazis or World War II. Some fans speculate that the show took the same course as the war. The conflict between these two eventually built to the point where there was a massive battle where one of them develops an atomic bomb to blow up the other person and ends up killing everyone around them. Moving on to number seven, we have the lost Sun theory. So, this theory basically states that Eustace and Mariel once were parents to a little boy named Jensen. Now, Eustace was so happy to have a son since he wanted a little mini version of himself. However, when Jensen was six months old, a wild animal stole him from his crib. Turns out he was stolen by the Cajun fox, who needed a baby to add to his Cajun baby stew. The Cajun fox in this series is known to cook and eat humans. In the episode Cajun Granny Stew, he tries to kidnap Mariel to use her as an ingredient in his stew. So it might just be that he kidnapped and cooked their baby Jensen. Then when Mariel saw Courage all alone in the alleyway, she felt that he could fill their empty void and act as a replacement for their lost child. But Eustace wasn't happy with this idea, which is why he's always grouchy and refers to him as the stupid dog. In our sixth spot, we have the abusive owner. Okay, so Eustace isn't the nicest towards Courage. He is verbally abusive to him, constantly yelling at him and calling him a stupid dog. Well, this theory believes that Courage is actually a little boy and Eustace is his abusive father. Eustace constantly calls him a stupid dog to make him feel worthless so he suffers from low self esteem and just imagines himself as a dog. This also explains why he is constantly afraid. It's years of abuse that has caused him to develop severe anxiety. The only one that truly loves him is his mom. He thinks others will harm him like his father does. That's why when Courage sees other individuals, he suffers from anxiety attacks, thinking they too will abuse him. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the puppets. So during the finale of season one, Eustace and Muriel were turned into puppets while Courage was controlling them. Well, 
People believe that for the following episodes, they remained in their puppet form and never turned back into humans. They theorize that Courage continued to act out his life with them. Everything that happened since that episode was all inside his head. He couldn't deal with the loss of his owners, so he pretends that they are still alive by puppeteering them. At number four, we have Nuclear Fallout. Now, this was technically disproven at the end of season two, but there are some people who still stand by the theory that this is really what is going on in this town. And it explains why all the strange stuff is happening in Gravity Falls. And really so many other series have this theory. We have The Simpsons has one, Spongebob has one, so it's only fitting that Gravity Falls has one too. The idea is that the source of all these strange things happening is the result of nuclear radiation from constant nuclear testing. This radiation has created a whole bunch of monsters and mutations, and that is why everyone in the show has to fight back all these creatures constantly. Number three, we have Grunkle Stan's hallucination. Grunkle Stan is the center point of the whole show. But what if he actually is the whole show? What if everything that happens in the show is all his imagination? I mean, he is an older man. He's not that old. He's not so old that he can't do things for himself, but perhaps poor lifestyle choices kicked off early onset Alzheimer's or even just getting hit in the head caused him to have some serious brain damage. We are just seeing the whole show through the eyes of an old man who is slowly losing his mind. I mean, that is super dark, but when you think about it, it's kind of a good case of going bonkers. I would hope that anyone's crazy hallucinations would be a as fun as Grunkle stands. Beats sitting around all day, that's for sure. This might explain why there's things like the memory gun. It's a metaphor for an old man losing his mind. That's why the show ends with him going back through all his memories through the photo album. If you had a grandparent who forgot everything, this might be the last thing you would want to do with them. And number two, we have the Mabel clone. Be careful with clones. If you get reckless, they will try and kill you and take your place. That is a classic clone plot. That is just a top 10 tip for you guys. I'm going to give you four free. Now, there is one episode of Gravity Falls where Dipper clones himself using a copying machine, so we know that cloning is possible in the universe. Cut to the episode where Mabel is getting notes in a bottle from Armando. One of those notes in a bottle says La Bomb. Some people think that this is the name of Mabel's clone that she has kept hidden from everyone. She made a clone of herself just in case she was ever killed or lost in time going on one of these adventures. The clone could then just move in and take her place so her friends and family wouldn't have to miss her and no one would find out about the secret stuff they've been doing in Gravity Falls. At number one, we have Grunkle Stan has been working with Bill Cipher. Whoa, this would put everything on its head, but just follow me for a moment. This is the idea that Bill Cipher was actually released by the Illuminati, because what is their symbol? Well, it's a pyramid with an eyeball on it. And what is Bill Cipher? Well, of course, he is a pyramid with an eyeball on it. So people think that Bill Cipher was conjured by the Illuminati and now controls it, leading the shadow government to world domination. But Grunkle Stan also wears a fez, that you know, that little hat he wears with a string on it and everything. Well, a lot of people have participated in secret organizations throughout the years have worn that same hat. It's a symbol as being part of these weird cults. So people think that Bill and Stan were in cahoots with each other. And then at the last second, Stan betrayed Bill so he could take control of the Illuminati himself and be the ruler of the shadow government. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Starting us off on number 10 is the future. Despite the movie taking place in the Pliocene era, aka the Crudacious period, this fan theory posits the movie actually actually takes place in the distant future. Altering genes is becoming more and more accessible by the year, and so the theory claims the human race in the movie had been altering genes for ages. It started off as a way to battle disease and provide food for the population. Scientists then started making custom house pets like mouse-sized elephants, cause I mean, why not? That became more common and the hybrids started getting even more eccentric. Industries also wanted better workers, so certain governments developed a new strain of human. Humans that were muscular but dumb for the most part. That way they'd be easier to control and since they're scared of anything new it made them that much easier to scare. Religious sects took offense to such an advanced alteration of God's creation so they attacked government facilities with weaponized viruses. But they spread and killed 14 billion people worldwide but not the humans made for labor. No, no, they were immune and thus the only ones left. And that is where the movie starts. Coming in at number 9 is the memory. Grug is irrationally paranoid of anything new and I get it, he's a Neanderthal all, they aren't the most intelligent and anything new can be frightening. But according to this fan theory, something incredibly traumatic happened to him during his childhood to make him the way he is. Grog's own family used to live in a cave much like the one they live in in the movie. One day his dad went out to hunt for some food and never returned. Worried and unable to fend for themselves, his mother went out to look for him and made him promise to stay in the cave until she returned. And as you can probably guess, she too never did. He never found out what happened to them, my guess is that they fell to their deaths or 
were mauled by animals, but Grug listened to his mum and stayed in that cave. He stayed and stayed in there until he was close to starving before finally venturing out to hunt for rabbits here and there. However, from that moment onwards, it was enshrined into his being not to leave the cave and that anything new or outside the cave was deemed unsafe. At number 8 we have Plato. The entire movie could very well be the personification of Plato's allegory of the cave. The allegory discussed people imprisoned in their own bodies, trapped in place, and who believe reality is all that appears to them on the walls of the cave through shadows. Now to dumb that down, it was Plato's way of trying to entice people to learn philosophy so they could grow as people and eventually reach enlightenment. Sure, the crews didn't go that far, but they did grow beyond just nomads with the help of Guy. If anything, Guy could have been Plato himself. The real teacher that enlightened the crudes. Yes, I know that's giving him a lot of credit, but I mean, that's what the theory proposes. Don't shoot the messenger, I'm just here delivering the message, you know what I mean? Filling the number seven slot is the parallel. The family dynamic of the crudes is very much what the traditional family dynamic was back in the day. I say back in the day, but it's not really that back in the past as you think. Many families in developing countries still function the way the crudes do. The man is the patriarch who controls everything the family does, especially the women. Some women can't step outside the house unless their husband and say so. Daughters aren't welcome to go outside because it's unsafe or they'll attract the unwanted attention of the male gaze. This theory suggests that the Croods made this dynamic look so ridiculous in hopes that families watching in the same predicament could learn from it. The evolution they have in the movie could inspire families now who are way more advanced in the Stone Age to stop living in it. Mic drop, I said what I said. And number six, we have Dipper wrote the journals. Well, this doesn't make a lot of sense for any fan of theories you know that this could not have happened, because the journals were written way before Dipper had any concept of Gravity Falls. Well, throughout the show we actually learn that time travel is a very real thing, that you can go back in time and alter events that were set in the future. So what if on his first run through, Dipper saw that Gravity Falls needed to be saved, but he failed? So then he wrote the journals, went back in time, and gave them to Stan, who hadn't had the metal plate in his head to prevent his memories from from being changed so then he changed his memories so we would forget about him because if Stan remembered it would have warped the future and he probably would have told Bill and Bill would have been on the lookout for Dipper. With this time loop Dipper was looking out for himself and the future of Gravity Falls before anyone even knew what was going on. But where is this alternate Time Lord version of Dipper? Well who knows maybe we'll find him in the future. At number 5 we have The Last Pine. Now let's get wrapped up in some famous things from other pop culture items. That is how you know your show is really starting to take off. If you follow the show, you know that Dipper and Mabel's last name is Pines. They are the Pine Twins. And eventually they get the power to travel through time as we covered in our last point. Well, what other famous thing has a ton of time travel in it? Well, Back to the Future. In the movie Back to the Future, Marty is at the Two Pines Mall. This is when he goes back in time. And when he does this, he crashes into a pine tree. So when he goes back to the future, the mall is now called the Lone Pine Mall. Well, the theory is that the Pine Twins were so famous in the town, popping up there through time travel, that that is why the mall was named the Two Pines Mall. And when the DeLorean was traveling through time, it actually hit one of the Pine Twins that was going through whatever sort of time portal, like they hit each other traveling through time, which killed one of the twins, and then only left the name as the Lone Pine Mall. But this is a very depressing theory, but who knows how time travel works? Maybe that is actually possible. In our fourth spot, we have the Evil Conductors. Now, each train is said to be able to move only when they have a train conductor on board. This was proven in one episode where a train was whipping along fast on the tracks. He couldn't stop himself because he had no conductor. Now, the trains are also shown to do some dark things to other trains. Does that mean that the conductors have complete control over the trains and their emotions? Well, yeah, that's what some people believe. So in one episode, the trains are at a scrapyard when they decide to bully another train. They are literally scaring him and pushing him and threatening him that he is going to be scrapped. That means that the conductors were all behind this and wanted to torment that poor train. Then in another episode, the trains create and execute a plan to basically rip a train in half to teach him a lesson. Why are these conductors so sinister? They are literally forcing the trains to harm each other for their own amusement. Moving on, at number 3 we have the murderer. 
So we've already established that Sir Topham, or as they call him, the Fat Controller, is out of his mind. And the Fat Controller is legit the name that they gave him. I didn't just make that up. They literally call him the Fat Controller. But people also theorize that he killed his child. So in one of the books, it is mentioned that Sir Topham has a son named Charles, but we never get to see him. Then in the episode called Tickled Pink, we see Hat's granddaughter, but not her parents. His granddaughter is having a birthday celebration, so it's weird that her parents aren't present. So people are convinced that Topham ended up killing his son one day out of a fit of rage. Maybe because he knocked up his girlfriend too young, who knows. Then later on we are introduced to a train named Charlie. And that's when people theorize that he killed his son and put his soul in a train. In fact, in one of the episodes, Charlie is shown to steal the fat controller's car. Uh. Hello, that happens in like every teenage movie. A rebellious son is mad at his parents and steals his car. So yeah, he's mad at his dad for literally killing him and making him trapped in a train. In our second spot, we have Sir Topham is in love with Thomas. You heard me correctly. The fat controller has a weird obsession with this train. So people believe this theory for many reasons. So in one of the episodes, Thomas gets lost on his way to the mainland. Everyone is searching for him, but Sir Topham is the most freaked out. He is so concerned that he has lost the love of his life. As a result, he gets angry at the other train, saying that they aren't looking for him hard enough. Now, when Thomas is found, Sir Topham throws off his hat and tries to hold back tears. He then says, he can always get another hat, but he'll never have another Thomas. Pretty creepy. He also declared Thomas to be train number one, because he is number one in his heart. How sweet. Or creepy. And in our number one spot, we have the insane tyrant. So the fat controller is the manager of the Northwestern Railway and is officially out of control. He is so manipulative and endlessly tortures and enslaves the trains. That's because he is slowly seeping deeper into madness and losing his mind. Let me explain. So Sir Topham Hat has given the trains very cruel punishments. For example, there was an episode where it was raining and Henry the train didn't want to ruin his paint, so he stayed inside a tunnel. Now, the fat controller didn't like this and wanted to get Henry out. When all of his attempts to get Henry out of the tunnel failed, he decided to punish him by bricking him in the tunnel. That's right. He built a brick wall so Henry wouldn't be able to escape the tunnel and he would have to live in there alone in the dark for the rest of his life. What kind of messed up punishment is that? Like he even said, we shall take away your rails and leave you here for always and always. He ended by saying, I think he deserved his punishment, don't you? Like he has no chill. Also, he likes to see the trains struggle. He often withholds useful information from the trains, resulting in them having conflicts that they need to solve themselves. These could have been avoided if he literally told the trains, but no, he rather see them suffer. So starting off this countdown, we have Tommy Taffy. So in the episode titled Freaky Fred, Muriel's cousin Fred pays them a visit. However, this episode starts to take a dark turn when we learn that Fred has an obsession with shaving people's hair. Now, Fred bears some interesting resemblances to the creepy pasta creature Tommy Taffy. So Tommy Taffy is said to come into families' homes and terrorize them. You have to do as Tommy says or else you will face the consequences. Let's address the similarities. Both Tommy and Fred have golden hair, light eyes, and both have a huge smile. Both Tommy and Fred show up unexpectedly at people's houses and end up torturing the individuals for pleasure. So people believe that Fred was based on the character Tommy Taffy or that he in fact is a version of Tommy or maybe even Tommy's brother. Either way, both those characters look terrifying with their wide smiles. Coming in at number 9, we have Hell. So this show is said to take place in the middle of nowhere. Shots of the bag's house show that they live completely isolated from the others in a desert-like environment. But yet, they are still greeted by multiple paranormal monster type creatures. Well, people theorize that this is because they are actually in a hell type underworld. The theory continues by making connections to Greek mythology. Eustace resembles Hades and Muriel resembles Persephone. Now, Courage is supposed to resemble Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guards the gate to the underworld. Although Courage isn't brave like Cerberus, he does protect his house from all sorts of things. He is also seen to shapeshift his head into other objects when he's trying to warn Muriel. Therefore, he technically does have multiple heads. In our eighth spot, we have the real-life villains. 
So there's no denying that this show has some pretty terrifying villains. What's even more terrifying is that people theorize that some of these villains symbolize real life people. For example, the character Fred is a sexual predator and the character Katz is a serial killer. Then you have the character The Perfectionist that teaches Courage how to be perfect and gets mad whenever he does something that's not perfect according to her standards. So she is said to suffer from OCD, where everything needs to be perfect. Then you have Eustace and Muriel who are a couple in an abusive relationship. And lastly you have the cruel veterinarian character. In the show this character sent Courage's parents to space and he tries to do the same to Courage. He is said to resemble Sergei Korolev, a Russian rocket engineer who experimented by sending dogs into space. But then you have some funnier ones like how King Ramses is a neighbor that used to sport something from and then he didn't give it back. So in the episode he keeps saying return the slab, aka return my hedge trimmer or whatever he borrowed. And number seven, we have the science experiment. So how are these two so smart? They are able to navigate the whole world, use tools, and even come up with complex plans even though they're just a cat and mouse. Well, some people think that it's all part of an experiment gone wrong. The idea is that Tom used to be a person. He was a scientist that was constantly using the same mouse for experiments. He wanted to see how far he could increase the intelligence of this mouse. Eventually, he was very successful and he made a mouse with genius level intellect. The mouse was actually so smart that was able to knock out the human version of Tom and then implant his brain to a cat's body. This is how the two of them are so smart, but why Jerry is a little bit smarter and why the two are constantly trying to kill each other at the drop of a hat. They don't need any motivation because there is a long-standing hate between the two of them. At number six, we have failure runs in the family. Is there a Warner Bros. Entertainment Universe? If there is, this theory could be true. The idea is that Tom from Tom and Jerry and Sylvester from Looney Tunes are part of the same family. They both do the same thing. They're both cats that are trying to chase down something that they can never get their hands on. It's this one little animal that always escapes them, always outsmarts them, and perhaps they always go back to the same family reunion and have discussions about how depressed and unsuccessful they are at catching these little critters. And number five, we have Jerry Gets Caught. With any show like this, you wonder what would happen if the underdog finally won. What would happen if Tom actually caught Jerry? Well, apparently the cartoonists for the show made an episode where this does happen. However, they did this while no one was looking and made the episode very gruesome. Legend says that someone found it, fired the cartoonist, and then took possession of the work, and this episode is now in an unknown location. If this is true, this piece would possibly be worth millions of dollars. And number four, we have Tom is on speed. Why is he going crazy all the time? Why can't he just chill out for two minutes? I get it that Jerry is a mouse, but I bet if you asked him to chill, he would probably be down to hang out, like peace and love, man. So the backbone of this theory is basically Tom's whole demeanor towards Jerry and the whole world, really. He is so reactive. He doesn't sit back for moments. He doesn't let anything just sink in. As soon as something triggers him, he's off and running, and usually this is how he ends up getting outsmarted by Jerry. Tom is also moving through the world at a million miles per hour. He never slows down for anything. It's like he's constantly revved up or on some sort of substance. He's angry all the time and aggression can be a side effect of speed or other amphetamine like drugs. So maybe if we took this little Tom cat to rehab, he would be a nice little kitty who wants to spend the rest of his time with his little mouse pal. And number three, we have it's a metaphor for heroin. I don't know if you guys have ever heard the expression chasing the dragon, but it's in reference to the first time you ever get high from injecting heroin. It's apparently the most intense experience you can have on opioids. Some people who get addicted to heroin are always trying to chase down that first high, trying to bring back that feeling that blew them out of this world. Well, what is the show talking Tom and Jerry. It's a cat that so badly wants to catch a mouse, but he never can. No matter how hard he tries, no matter how close he gets, or how crazy of a mouse trap he builds, he never is able to get what he wants. Maybe this is true. Maybe the creator of the show was struggling with a drug addiction, and this was a problem he expressed through a kid's cartoon. Or it's just a cartoon and we're looking way too deep into this. In our second spot, we have the true story. Alright, if you weren't already creeped out, you will be now. Turns out, that this show may be loosely based on a true story. So this show takes place in the middle of nowhere. Turns out there is a house in New Mexico that bears a striking resemblance to the house in the show. If that wasn't weird enough, the owners of the house were an elderly couple that claimed they witnessed strange occurrences while living there, such as 
paranormal activity, and they claim to have even seen a creature known as the Skinwalker. The freakiest part? The couple disappeared and only their dog was found at their house. So could this be true? Did the skin taker or another monster kidnap the couple? Looks like we'll never know. Unless someone wants to go investigate, then good luck. Coming in at our number one spot, we have the real life killer. So this theory surrounds the idea that the entire show is based on the real life killer, David Parker Ray. David was a kidnapper, murderer, and torturer. Now, David had three different tactics that he would use to get to his victims. So number one, he would have a sad story to gain sympathy from them and then the victims would allow them to enter their house. Number two, he would persuade them with money and three, he would cut the phone lines. All of these tactics are used by different villains in the show. The villain, the storm goddess, gained entry into the bag's home by crying and saying she lost her precious dog. The zombie film director entered their home with promises of a large sum of money if they let them shoot at the house. And Le Quack was shown to cut off the cable antenna and then entered the home claiming he was a TV repairman. Now, if those resemblances weren't freaky enough, David was said to disguise himself as different individuals. Meaning, he would disguise himself as different villains, just like how there are multiple villains in the show. 